Live from downtown Vancouver at the Vancouver Film School campus, it's time for EP Live. Hey, welcome to EPN. My name is Victor Lucas, and we bring you the latest on everything cool. Thank you so much. It's good to see everybody here. It's good to see everybody online. We've got a treat today. Uh, we have Tom Kalinske, the former president of Sega. He was there during the Genesis heyday and uh, launched the Sega Saturn. He is on the show today. I am so freaking excited that we get to talk with Tom. Uh, I had a brief chat with him uh, already today, and uh, it was just amazing to connect with him, and I know you guys are going to love him. Uh, He's coming up right after the rundown. Um, you may hear the occasional uh, horn honk. We're right here on Hastings Street at 390 West Hastings in Vancouver, B.C. So if you ever want to come down and watch a live show, you can. We're at the VFS Cafe. Uh, there is a protest going on right now with uh, forestry. And so these big trucks are driving by honking their horns right outside on the street. But that's okay. It's live, and they have every right to protest. And uh, you may hear them. It might sound a little bit like geese. Um, but it's not. It's, it's, uh, it's forestry uh, protesting something. I don't know the details on that. Uh, we've got a rundown to get to, and this one is going out to our friend Neba, who said, I'd like to point out that Vic pronounced Rachel Ghoul correctly. True Batman fan. Awesome show, Vic. Thank you very much. This rundown is all yours. The Medal of Honor series is coming back for another tour of duty. Titanfall and Apex Legends developer Respawn Entertainment has announced Medal of Honor Above and Beyond, an all-new VR entry in the series. It's set during World War II with players going behind enemy lines to work with the French resistance against the Nazis. This is the first Medal of Honor game since 2012 and the first one from Respawn, which EA bought in 2017. It's worth noting that this will be the first VR game from the studio, not counting uh, <clears throat> their, their work with... Uh, uh, Battlefront 1 that they did with Criterion, which wasn't a full game. But, man, that was awesome where you get to pilot the X-Wing. Anyways, they're working closely with Oculus, which means it will be an Oculus exclusive when it deploys next summer. Some very exciting announcements, actually, with Oculus. This is one of them. Um, I think it's awesome that uh, EA just kind of went down the highway and, and did something with Facebook and Oculus to put something together. It makes sense, right? Uh, and, you know, it's great that they're doing a Medal of Honor game, and it looks like uh, they're putting a ton of production efforts into this. Peter Hirschman, I think, is the guy that's running production on this. He used to work at uh, LucasArts. He's got a long, great track record, and he's a great uh, leader, especially, I think he used to do the, uh, I think he did, uh, like, the flying games. Remember LucasArts used to have these flight uh, combat experiences. He was in charge of a lot of that stuff. So it was great to see his face again. And I've loved the Medal of Honor games over the years. I do have to admit, I talked to Blake a little bit about this before we started rolling. <clears throat> we have certainly gone to battle in World War II in video games quite often. Uh, but I guess we've never really done it like this in VR with this level of production polish. Other cool announcements, though, is the fact that uh, uh, there's going to be uh, finger tracking, hand tracking with VR through Oculus next year. So you're not going to even need a controller. You can see your hands and manipulate objects in, in uh, virtual space through your VR headset. And Oculus Quest, which uh, I'm a huge fan of, it's the one that doesn't have any cables. It doesn't. It's all sort of, uh, uh, you know, self-contained. It doesn't have to be connected to anything. Well, you can connect it now through a USB-C cable to your souped-up PC, and you can run Rift games on your Oculus Quest, which was a great announcement and a great move, quite frankly, because there's some uh, Rift titles that have a, you know, that require a little bit more horsepower. So that's pretty exciting, especially for those people out there that already are into the Quest ecosystem. Now they've got more ways to play. Uh, so congrats to Facebook and to Oculus. It's nice to see that uh, uh, you're, not, you're not resting on anything. Even though the Quest was quite successful this year, you're still pushing forward on some cool announcements. All right, uh, with Batman, uh, Batwoman about to swoop down, DC has even more badass women coming to the, to, to the airwaves. A new Arrowverse spinoff show focusing on the crime-fighting team The Canaries is in the works. Variety reports that the show will star Catherine McNamara as Black Star, Katie Cassidy as Black Siren, and Juliana Harkavi. Uh, I hope I said that right. Harkavi? Harkavi? Is that her name? 
I, I think I said that right, as Black Canary, all three of them reprising their roles from Arrow and other shows in the small screen universe. This would be the sixth series in the Arrowverse, although given that several other spinoffs have already been in development and failed to get off the ground, we'll have to wait and see if this one becomes a reality. In the meantime, the first episode of Batwoman pre uh, premieres on October 7th. It's coming up quick. Very excited to see that. Uh, even though I don't know if I've said her name right, Juliana Har Harkavi, Harkavi as uh, Black Canary has uh, really impressed me, actually. She came in uh, on Arrow a, a few seasons ago, and right away she made a huge impression. She's uh, badass and super tough and a cool character, and I like that she's taken over uh, the role of Black Canary. I was actually also uh, you know, happy to see Katie Cassidy, who left the show, come back to the show and uh, with some you know, new dynamics and stuff. So this... This could be really cool. Uh, the other rumor that I've heard about this is that they might be recasting Green Arrow, and Green Arrow might be uh, featured in here. Stephen Amell, uh, he's going off to a new show. Uh, I forget what the name of that show is, but he's leaving the superhero world. Um, I think it's a wrestling thing that he's doing. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, but... Um, I, I am excited about this. I do want there to be uh, Green Arrow still in the Arrowverse. I love the character of Green Arrow, and uh, even though Stephen Amell has done a great job as as you know Oliver Queen, it would be fine for them to have another Green Arrow in this space. Uh, but I'm happy for all three of these people, and I know that a lot of fans were very concerned that a lot of these actors and a lot of these characters were just going to go poof when uh, Arrow wraps up its eighth and final season this year. Happy to see that that might not be the case. Uh, there is one other little bit of news that has come in about the Arrowverse. Uh, yesterday, Michael Rosenbaum, who played Lex Luthor on Smallville for uh, across 10 seasons, but he left the show early, I think, to regrow his hair uh, he, and to take other roles. Uh, he was amazing as Lex Luthor, but he, he posted on social media that uh, he wasn't happy with the way that he was asked to be a part of uh, this big crisis on infinite Earths. He didn't get enough information, didn't know when it was shooting, where it was shooting. He needed to commit on the day that they asked him and so he backed off my suspicion is that we're going to hear something very different soon and that he will be a part of this or maybe they will shock surprise us I, I mean we know almost all of the people that are going to be on this crisis it's starting to not feel like it's going to be a big we're just going to be waiting for the cameos you know uh but it's uh I, I'm fired up about this. There's going to be a lot of familiar superhero faces on these, uh, you know, crossover shows. So it's going to be a lot of fun, hopefully. Uh, now, Microsoft is about to join the cloud gaming revolution with Google Stadia and other cloud services on the way. Microsoft has revealed that their own service called Project X Cloud will begin its first public beta test next month. It'll only be available in the U.S., U.K., and Korea, and will start with four games, Halo 5, Killer Instinct, Sea of Thieves, and the all-new Gears 5. And for now, will be limited to mobile devices running Android. When the final version arrives, it will all allow users to play a library of Xbox One games on pretty much any device they want, as long as you have a fast enough internet connection, because all the number crunching will be done in the cloud. No word yet on how much it'll cost. I wonder if they're going to do something where if you have Xbox Game Pass and Xbox Live, you're good. I can't see them, you know, turning to that subscriber base and saying, hey, you know, we need another 10 bucks from you. I, I just, I think they're probably going to throw in a lot of these services. Um, and I, I don't expect any of this stuff, including Stadia, to be uh, smooth as glass as it all launches. I think there's going to be a lot of bumpiness in the road here. Uh, but, you know, truth, truthfully, these are exciting times. The fact that we're going to get uh, the potential for like 8K video coming off of other computers that we don't have to pay for uh, and it's going to stream to whatever glass we've got that sounds pretty damn cool to me it does sound a little utopian uh, but that's what these uh, beta tests are all about so we're going to start to see how this works in the real world in about a month all right now the next jurassic movie is digging up some very old fossils Blake Siefkin wrote that, everybody. There he is. He's over there. Uh, di director uh, Colin Trevorrow has announced that Jurassic World 3 will reunite original Jurassic Park stars Jeff Goldblum as Ian Malcolm, Sam Neill as Alan Grant, and Laura Dern as Ellie Sattler. Although they've appeared separately in various Jurassic sequels over the years, this will be the first time all three of them are back together again since the first film was released in 1993. Given the ending of the last film, Fallen Kingdom, which I've tried to scrub out of my mind, because it just got stupid. 
there was some good stuff in that movie. Anyways, given the ending of the last film, Fallen Kingdom, it's safe to say that the three will be putting their dino expertise to good use alongside returning stars Chris Pratt and Bryce Dallas Howard. Jurassic World 3 lands in summer 2021. I just remember Jurassic Park turning into like um, like a horror house movie in Jurassic World. So it was not even a world. It shrunk down to all the dinosaurs inside of a mansion. It was just so dumb. And it started with a big volcano blast and dinosaurs running for their land. That was cool. And then we're inside of a house. Like, I don't know who. Oh, it was Colin Trevorrow. Did he? Well, wait, did Colin Trevorrow direct the last one? Oh, he produced it. Okay. Well, hopefully this is a move in the right direction. Love all of these actors. It'll be fun to see them on screen again. Um, and, uh, you know, the Jurassic series, it's kind of turning into Jaws as a series. <laughs> there are excellent ones, and then there's a lot of ones that just seem to parody the, the roots of, the, of this franchise that Steven Spielberg created. I... I I wonder if they'll ever get back to the quality of that very first experience, which just blew my mind when I saw it in the theater back in the day. And I do hope that now that they've got these three uh, beloved stars, I tweeted about this in my snarky little uh, tweet last night, but I hope that they put all three of these stars on screen together, unlike what they did with Harrison Ford, Carrie, Fish Carrie Fisher, and uh, Mark Hamill in Star Wars, because uh, we want to see them together, right? That's If you're going to cast them, put them all together. All right, you guys, that's going to do it for our rundown today. Thank you so much for watching that. Now let's take a look back at this day in Everything Cool. Welcome to This Day in Everything Cool for September 25th. On this day in 2007, Master Chief's journey came to an end, at least for a little while. Microsoft and Bungie released Halo 3 on the Xbox 360, marking the franchise's debut on the HD console. The first two Halo games were easily the biggest and most recognizable titles on the original Xbox, so Halo 3 was one of the most hyped titles for the 360 and was one of the biggest selling points for the system. Along with better graphics and audio, Bungie used the extra power of the 360 to deliver levels on a much grander scale than ever before, with more enemies, vehicles, and intricate action sequences. Over in multiplayer, Halo 3 was the first game in the series to feature the Forge map editing tools, allowing players to tweak and make changes to existing maps. As for the story, it brought the Halo trilogy to an epic finale, with humankind's war against the Covenant coming to a head. The game ends on a cliffhanger that implies Master Chief had died, so the next two games, ODST and Reach, even focused on other characters, although Master Chief made his return in Halo 4. As for Halo 3, it went on to become one of the best received titles in the franchise and helped cement the 360's dominance over its biggest rival, the PlayStation 3. All right, you guys, we have a very special guest on the show today, somebody that I've been wanting to talk to, well, since E3 1995, when I first saw Tom Kalinske on stage at the uh, Sega of America uh, press conference where Tom Kalinske announced that the Sega Saturn would be available uh, tomorrow. Uh, but here we are, the Sega Genesis Mini is out on shelves and people are rediscovering classic Sega Genesis games and falling in love all over again. And Tom Kalinske was there. Please put your hands together for Mr. Tom Kalinske, everybody. <laughs> How are you, Tom? Great, great to be with you. I have to ask, um, what was the pull for you with video games? What did you see in video games that you said, you know what, I think this could be the right move for me? A, a number of things. First of all, it, it's just a heck of a lot of fun to play a, a good video game. And you, you can really tell a good video game because it feels good when you're playing it and you have your, your hands on the controllers. And the ability for the challenge that's involved and being able to, you know, win a little bit every now and then and get thrown back and having to do it all over again. I just found it to be a, a really great form of entertainment. And one thing that most people don't talk about that I believe strongly in, I think video games offer the highest value, dollars spent, all entertainment, whether it's music or, or movies or, or uh, you know, anything else, books, whatever. You think about it, the amount of money you spend on a great video game, pennies per hour of enjoyment, pennies. Oh, movies, what, dollars now or something? So it's $5.50 an hour? Yeah. We're talking about pennies per hour. Yep, that's true. Were you already a player before you came, you went over to, to Sega? Were you were you buying and playing video games by that point? Funny story, not, not 
much. I had an early Pong, obviously. Yeah. And uh, and I was at Mattel, and we started in television. And in te- you may not know the whole story there. In television was started by a couple of guys that actually I was president of the toy division. And it was started by Mike Katz and I got an, an inventor named Richard Chang, and they invented the handheld things, which we actually marketed to dads on Father's Day the first right. year, and they were highly successful. Well, the board of directors decided that. Mattel Electronics was so successful, we should separate it from the toy company and make it its own division. All of a sudden, this and and we had, they had started to work on television, and I saw the early in television work, and I liked it. And uh, nope, you're a toy guy. We're going to start our own electronics division, taking this away from you. Well, needless to say, I was a little miffed about that. <laughs> and. Uh, and while we were, you know, we had a very successful toy business with Barbie and E-Man and Hot Wheels and what have you. Uh, but I was, I, I tell you the truth, I was jealous of the Mattel Electronics toy division. I did play in television games. I, I got them for free, so I pretty much had to. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, was, I was annoyed. Oh, that's awesome. And so you were going to, I guess, the toy fairs in New York City and, and, uh, and talking about Masters of the Universe and Hot Wheels and things like that. Exactly, exactly. We'd have all the buyers come out before Toy Fair in New York to a resort in either Arizona or California. And we'd wine and dine them and show them, the, show them the whole product line and had buyers from all over the world. And so that was, that was my, my little, little world. That's it's awesome. kind of interesting that I was on the board of directors of Link, the, the corporate parent. I started to hear from retailers that Atari had backed up an inventory at retail, and in television had backed up a lot of inventory at retail. And retailers were getting very concerned. Mm. So once again, I am, I'm a board member at Mattel. I mentioned this to the rest of the board members. And the chairman of the board at the time, who loved Mattel Electronics to death, said, yeah, well, well, you st- stick with the toy business. You don't know much about this Mattel. Oh! Oh, my God. So you were getting, I guess, some early insight into the crash that happened yeah, in 1983. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I had early insight into the crash, and who knows better than the buyers of retail. They certainly know when inventory starting to back up. Absolutely. So uh, anyway, another another sort of side tale to my feeling of woe over losing in television, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's amazing because uh, it, you're, you're truly, uh, you know, you're a big figure in the video game space. I, I posted on my Facebook uh, uh, page that I was interviewing you today, and I had friends that are mutual friends of ours across the industry chime in and say that they're incredibly excited that you're going to be on because you've worked with everybody. You, you know, you worked with in television people. Don Daglow is a, is a common friend of ours. Yeah. And, uh, and then... What happened with Sega? Did they court you? Did they say, uh, you know, we want you to come over and, and, you know, use your merchandising experience to help us take a run at Nintendo? It's kind of interesting. I, I actually, while I was at Mattel, had met Hayao Nakayama. And remember back in those days, it was kind of a strange thing. Sega actually reported to Paramount Pictures. Right. Uh, Miller and, uh, and Mike Eisner. Wow. I'd have meetings over there at Paramount because we would about licensing some of the Sega properties for toys. And they would think about, should we do a game, those days a, 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 con, a console arcade game, should we do a, an arcade console, a Mattel property. So we had these discussions going on. So I knew them way back then. And then I actually left Mattel in 1987. I got an entrepreneurial, then I bought Matchbox toys out of receivership in the UK with a friend of mine, a, friend of mine in in, uh, in Hong Kong really knew how to manufacture. He was a been a manufacturing vendor for Mattel and Hasbro and really knew how to manufacture. Well, companies are in receivership for a reason. Yeah. Things aren't going well. Yeah. So we we spent the next three years turning Matchbox around and, and getting it profitable and getting great distribution in Europe and the United States. And Hayao Nakayama asked me then if I would be interested in taking over the distribution the 8-bit master system. Well, at the time, Tonka had it, I think. And I, I looked at it and I said, you know, this isn't that much different than what I saw on in television, and I think the world needs something really different if it's going to be successful in video games. So I turned him down. And uh, we ended up, uh, we took Fox Public, we ended up selling it, and I wasn't doing anything. I was literally on vacation, and Nakayama-san tracked me down 
you got to come to Japan and see what 16-bit technology is. I know you didn't like 8-bit, but see what 16-bit is. So I, I ended up doing that, and I fell in love with 16-bit. It just blew my mind, frankly. I remember back then thinking, wow, nothing can be better than this. <laughs> that is amazing. Did you see it um, prior to anything launching? Did you see it like in oh, 19... Yeah. Oh, yeah? Yeah. And uh, describe and that it, for, for us. What was oh, that it, like? It really, it really was just the games that they, they had, that they were doing on it. And most of it was arcade translations. Uh, you, know, you know, so... Uh, uh, gosh, uh, Altered Beast, of course, was what became the end title. There was uh, race games. Uh, Monaco GP was fantastic. Yep. I mean, everything just looked so much better. 16-bit machine than, a, than an 8-bit machine. Golden Axe was incredible. So I, re I remember thinking, wow, this is, this is really something. And I was, I was really inspired to uh, take that challenge on. How, Tom, how do you, how did you stay so connected to, I, I guess, the enthusiasm of imagination? Like, how did you know that, you know, consumers would like your toys, and then consumers would would want the Sega Genesis? Well, you know, sometimes it's just your gut feeling, and if you have a really good gut, that can take you a long way. But yeah. I also, I also relied on on research, and I relied on on. I relied on focus groups, watching people play. So all, all of those things came came to bear on uh, what my ended up my decisions on whether to do a game or not to do a game. And also, I was always looking for something really different. And if you think about it, in the history of toys and video games, and probably every other industry, those things that just look outlandish and crazy at the time often ended up huge successes i mean imagine the first time i saw toe jam and earl what the hell is this you know <laughs> but but something that different and outlandish ended up being very very successful when you were at sega was a big part of your job to kind of um approve the budgets and to to basically you know turn the turn the key on getting some of these games getting made yeah absolutely i was sort of the uh Paul Rio and I were the guys who controlled the controlled the budget and whether a game got made or not. And we didn't we relied on the marketing team and the R and D team and we had fantastic people. I mean you you, you know many of them, Al Nielsen and, and um Alan Canapa Schroeder and Diane Fernassier, Pam Kelly and uh, uh, of course my right arm, Joe Miller. Yeah. He he could tell you why a game was good or not. And and I relied on him and trusted him implicitly. Talk to me about the, um, the early marketing of, of the Sega Genesis, because Nintendo had uh, locked in a lot of market share and mind share in the video game space um, through, throughout the, uh, the, you know, the very late 80s and early 90s, and it looked like it was going to be hard to create something that could go up against them. but. The marketing on the Genesis was so smart, and you really kind of pulled a lot of eyeballs in that direction. Well, again, it really wasn't j j just me either. And the guy that uh, was at Sega when I arrived, Mike Katz, had been my marketing director of uh, handheld video games at Mattel, so I knew him very, very well. And he's the guy who actually started the Sega does what Nintendo don't <laughs> line. So you know, he was he was there when that was done. Uh, he wasn't getting along well with everybody in Japan, and you know you have to have a team. You have to have people that really trust and respect one another. So we had to part ways with Mike, and then uh, you know basically promoting inside of the company, the Mattel. I mean the Mattel, the uh, marketing team of Al Nielsen and and Hugh Bowen and uh, some other guys, and they really were terrific. Uh, and Diane Fornasier. Um, and I, I must say, you know, my only goal and strategy is I want to be different, and I wanted to take on Nintendo not by trying to do the same things they were doing after a definite older age, definitely teens and college age. And we did a lot of stuff, uh, roots-wise, to go after those audiences. And also to, like, you know, we wanted to have games that were edgy. Therefore, we're, if, if the equivalency is an R-rated movie, we wanted an R-rated movie. And so uh, that's what we did. Uh, and along, uh, by the way, of course, the other main thing, and uh, God, how could I possibly forget that? We needed a character to compete with Mario. Yeah. 
clearly the development of that character, the Japan team and Naka and Oshima and, and Isahara and our U.S. team of Nielsen and Diane Frenassier and Madeline Schroeder, they really crafted a great character in Sonic the Hedgehog. Sonic, of course, was one of the main weapons we had slow plotting Mario, we could show a very fast moving, you know, <laughs> almost teenage personality character. So all of those, all of those things uh, went into play and in going after uh, Nintendo. The, uh, the company changed a lot with the success of Sega, I would imagine. Did it feel like the same place that you started work at as it grew and grew and started to, you know, gain all of its success through the Sega Genesis era? Oh, it was very different because initially when I arrived there, remember, as I think you pointed out at the start of this, Nintendo had a 95% share and Sega had a 2% share or something, and there were a couple other guys hanging on. And uh, so that's kind of depressing. You know, that's not a great, wonderful, uplifting atmosphere to be in. So we yeah. had, to, had to start having successes and started had to start doing things that were fun and interesting. And, uh, and, and, and I inspired, or at least I tried to inspire, that kind of work. One fun thing we did was we had a Golden Chicken Award. So you had a great idea, and we all thought it was a great idea. It's the greatest idea I've ever heard of for a product. And then it failed. Putting a rubber chicken over your uh, desk and give you a $100 <laughs> check. <laughs> was there a... Um... Uh, you know, a favorite game that, that crossed your path? I know that they must have all felt like your children, right? Because you must have cared deeply about every one that you sent out there. But was there one that you kind of had your, that you fell in love with and that you shepherded along and that you were very happy that the world got to play? Yeah, I'm, of course, for me, my favorite game of, of the whole Genesis era was Sonic 2. And I still play it. I still have it down in my game room. But there were a lot of other things. I mean, I was really proud of what we managed to do with Joe Montana football. For, for a while, we, we outsold Madden football from, uh, from EA. Really happy with what we did with uh, Streets of Rage. Uh, I was really happy with what we did with Echo the Dolphin. I thought that's a masterpiece, a work of art. Still, I still love that game, too. We had Ed uh, on this show not too long ago. He was wonderful. Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah, that's still a good friend, too. Yeah. And, uh, and then, of course, uh, Jam and Earl, which I mentioned earlier. And then, yeah, yeah, you're right. They're all like kids to you, you know, after a while, especially the ones that are somewhat successful. That's awesome. Was there a, um, a surreal moment for you as, uh, you know, the Genesis started to, uh, you know, cross over? And, and uh, you must have been hearing from very interesting fans from all over the world, maybe some famous celebrities or something visited the office. Was there ever a day where you're like, how did this happen to me? Yeah, no, that's a really good point. A lot of uh, famous people came and visited. I probably won't remember all of them, but um, some of them that were really key of course, Michael Jackson loved video games. Yeah. He, you know, every now and then I'd go down to R&D and there'd be Michael Jackson, <laughs> our R&D group, playing video games with the guys, uh, which was sort of, that's sort of surreal. Yes. But, and then a, another guy who'd come in because we'd be working on it would be Joe Montana. Sometimes he'd bring some of his favorite characters along, like Ronnie Lott and Ray Rice. So those guys would come in and play video games. And then had this assistant who was in love with the New York Mets. So mm. anytime the New York Mets came to San Francisco to play the Giants before the game, or you know, maybe the day before, they would stop in at Sega and all this whole Met team would be down there playing video games. So oh, that, that was a little unusual too. That is awesome. That is awesome. I've got some questions here that people uh, sent our way, and I want to include a couple here. Sure. Um, I got one from uh, Blair Farrell, who is a big superhero video game fanatic, and you guys published some... Uh, well, his question is, Sega published games starring characters from both Marvel and DC Comics. How difficult was it to work out those deals? And because you work with both of them, did you ever have any conflicts? That's a, that's a really good question. And... Uh... I, I loved uh, characters that Marvel and, and DC did. I still do love them. And, uh, you know, they were, it, it's kind of changed over time. Remember early on when uh, Ike Perlmutter bought Marvel, it was really down in the dumps. He and Avi Arad and some other guys put some money into it. Yes. And, uh, and brought it back to 
to life, if you will. Yes. Avi had been actually a toy inventor before he got with Marvel. I been a toy closeout guy. Before, and that's how he made all his money. Wow. He made enough money to buy Marvel. So I knew those guys really well. I think we had a really good relationship. And, I, and another game I didn't mention that I was really proud of, I think Ed Annunziata worked on it too, was Spider-Man. Our Spider-Man yes. game was yeah. a terrific, terrific game. So, uh, so I liked that. And we didn't have many issues with, with them. I don't all major issues with DC Comics. There, maybe there were some. I mean, a lot. You know, the most difficult guys to work with were Disney. You know, they were so demanding on their characters, and gosh, <laughs> everything had to be absolutely perfect. And you know, it was really hard to get stuff approved as they were perfectionists to protect very, very, very valuable IP. We are actually, we just uh, wrapped up production on the making of the Aladdin game for Sega Genesis. Oh, and uh, and the, they were talking about the, uh, the, the, the team that worked on it from Virgin worked closely with Sega. And they mentioned that your team saw the game and wanted to invest in it because it was so state of the art. That's exactly right. And there was joint collaboration toward the end of it. And then one of the funny things was, uh, so had... Uh, not Eisner, but the guy up before him. Oh, Jeffrey Katzenberg. Jeff, Jeffrey Katzenberg coming through E3, see the game. And I'd known Jeffrey for years from other, other work. Yeah. And had an earpiece on where I could hear what was going on in the showroom. And Diane, Diane Fernassier, I think it was, was saying, we can't let him in yet. We don't have the game here. You know, the, the person who was working on the game got sick last night and they're still asleep in the hotel room in downtown uh, uh, Los Angeles. So uh, I had to delay Jeffrey and he thought I was kind of crazy. So I'd say, Jeff, let's go look at EA. And we'd wander through there. Jeff, let's go get a cup of coffee. We'd go over and get a cup of coffee. And he just kind of stomped his foot and said, would you take me to see Latin? And so I heard just as we were walking very slowly toward the Sega booth, I heard in my eighth piece, we got the EEPROM, you can bring him in. And so we did, and of course he he loved the game, and the same thing was Richard Branson was there, and he loved the game. So it really was a, it was a terrific experience. That is it's awesome. A little backstory to the, that whole Disney thing, too, you probably aren't aware of. Okay. You remember, you may not remember, we did the Fantasia game on Genesis. Yes, I do, yeah. The movie Fantasia. Yeah. We, had, we were manufacturing it actually here in our plant over in Fremont, California, across the bay. We made 50,000 of these cartridges and packaged them, and I think we had orders for something like 300,000. Mm. And the phone rings. It's the head of Disney Interactive, and he says, you got to stop the Fantasia game, stop production. If you've shipped any to retail, you have to recall them. You have to destroy all the ones you have in your warehouse. Oh, so, my what? God. Oh, my God. So... I'm coming up to explain it to you. I'll be there at 8 a.m. at SFO. So I pick him up at the airport. Now, of course, my heart is beating faster than you can imagine. And I thought, <laughs> oh, my God, what did my cra crazy programmers do? Did they put an Easter egg in there in the middle of the Fantasia game where a naked lady jumps out or something? <laughs> what the heck did they do? And uh, this fellow, he, I think it was Steve Burke, he, said, he says to me, no, it's not your fault. Completely our fault. Said, what do you mean? He said, Before Walt Disney died said to the management team, I don't want Fantasia merchandised. You merchandise most movies. I just don't want anything done with it. Well, oh. Everybody in the company had forgotten this, except wow. for Roy Disney, who was oh still in the company, his nephew. Yeah. He sees the Genesis game and has a fit. He said, don't you remember what Walt said? You have to recall it. So that was why we had to recall it. Disney's credit said, we'll make up the lost profit you making sure you have great licenses, and good uh, royalty rates. And, and to their word, they did make it up. And that's why we, one of the reasons we did so well with a lot. <laughs> oh, that is amazing. That is awesome. Um, okay, we've got a gr another great question. This one is from uh, a former games journalist, and now he is making video games. Uh, his name is Greg Seward, and he says, uh, how much uh, more life do you think that the Genesis had in it had Sega not shifted so completely to the Sega Saturn? This might be a touchy subject for you, I think. Well, it is a touchy subject for me because I did not want to introduce I, the Saturn early. I didn't, I didn't think we had enough hardware ready to manufacture. We certainly didn't have enough software or enough titles. Yep. 
And I really fought against this, fought against it, fought against it. And this was one of the few times in my career where I was completely overruled in order to introduce the Saturn early. But I really believe we had another year in life with Genesis because we had great titles. We had a great, loyal audience. Uh, I think it was just one of those, those things. It was a mistake. Yeah. Yeah, I talk about this quite often too because the uh, the artwork that was being done in video games during the Sega Genesis and Super Nintendo era was so very different from the Saturn and PlayStation and Nintendo 64 era. It's almost like two different industries, and I feel like a lot of those people that were so skilled in making great 2D games probably had a lot of challenges when they were told, okay, now we make everything in 3D, and, and I, I'm sure you had to contend with that. I, I, I think you're right. I think that really was a big challenge. I know this will sound crazy, but back in those days, a lot of the 2D artists really hated the look of 3D. Mm. They thought it made everything look like a bathtub toy. Right. They, they wanted they, they wanted doing 2D games. There was a lot of conflict internally, and I think some of those people, some of those very talented people, got angry and kind of left the industry. Yeah. Well, it's interesting that we've come full circle. And these, you know, your your system is back, and all of these games are back. But then there's also all of these new developers that just sort of focus on 2D. And what does that feel like for you? Because uh, you know, you were one of the champions of of video games as a medium, and it feels like every you know month we get a new game that feels like a Sega Genesis game. This whole era of interest in that time period and Genesis games unbelievable to me frankly i mean i remember when uh the author of console wars blake harris approached me four years ago or five years ago he said hey everybody's interested in that period of time when you were ceo of sega of america i want to do a book on it and i said are you like crazy there's probably 200 people in the world who care he said no 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 you're wrong and then of course since then there's this huge upswell of people that are interested in Retro, I, I call them retro video games, that period of time, uh, a lot of documentaries being made, lots of articles being written, and it's, it's, it's overwhelming to me, it's amazing to me that there's still this great level of, of interest in what we created way back then. Did, did you have any sense of the, I mean, obviously you saw the success and the dollars and the money being made, but did, did you also appreciate the sort of cultural impact, how much it was manifesting, you know, in, in, in imagination in people's lives. And, and like I, I told you before we rolled today that the Genesis, I can directly trace back my inspiration to launch Electric Playground to sharing the Genesis with my roommates. And yeah. that story has got to be, you know, resonating. Like, that similar kind of story resonates probably all over the world. I, I think you're right. And I, I don't think about that very much other than I, I very proud to have been associated with something that brought so much enjoyment to so many hundreds of millions of people's lives and that the characters we created still exist and are still strong characters today. And in a strange sort of way, I feel a lot about it, the way I felt about Barbie when we worked on Barbie and we brought Barbie back from the dead and literally, but, uh, <laughs> and, and, and we, we started with the line, Hey girls with you can be anything you want it to be and we started doing all these different occupations of doctors and veterinarians and engineers and school teachers and what have you rebuilt that line i i can almost i run into ladies days who say oh i played with a superstar barbie and i said oh well you're 35 <laughs> you know, I, I can tell their ages by what dolls they played with. But having built that brand, uh, rebuilt that brand, I, I, I feel the same way about this and Sega. We, we did something important. I'm not quite sure what it was, but I know it made an awful lot of people happy. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. You, um, you had some fierce competition, though, in the industry, and I'm wondering, uh, you know, I, I knew Howard Lincoln quite well because he was there when I was visiting Nintendo, and I'd interview him every once in a while, and Peter Main. What was your relationship with Nintendo? Did, was, it, was it what the commercials <laughs> looked like, or was it, was it a little bit more uh, cordial? It wasn't uh, great. It wasn't <laughs> terribly cordial, except Howard and I did get along. Yeah. Way. I actually, when I was at uh, Matchbox, I had done a Matchbox uh, game on the NES. Oh, so, wow. So we had a, we had a relationship. 
Maine and I did not have a very good relationship, and partly mm. because he was sort of the spokesperson for the company, yeah. and we'd go to these industry events, and usually he would speak before me, and you know, by 1993, according to all the research, he would pass them in share of market, and he just couldn't accept that. You know? yeah. So he'd get up and talk on the stage and show his slides on how they were really beating us, and we were uh, just a gnat on the wall, and not important, and passing fat. They were the real deal, on and on and on. And I used to get up after he had spoken, and I'd say, you know, listening to Peter's like listening to Dr. Kaborkian. It's <laughs> not very inspiring. And, and then I'd, I'd go into my spiel. So Peter and I never had a great relationship. Howard and I did. Howard and I, without the two of us, I don't think the ESA would have ended up being formed, or the, the, actually the ESA initially before we changed it to the ESA. I don't think the... He fought against the rating system for a long, long time. Yeah. Finally got on board and understood it. And uh, so we had an okay relationship. And when I left the industry, he wrote me a very, very nice note. Uh, basically thanking me for tough competitor and all the things we had done together and forming the industry association and the rating system. So uh, I, I still have that note. and I was, I'm very pleased to have received it. That's awesome. Uh, well, Tom, you you you, uh, you gave us a lot of incredible art, my friend. And um, you know, I know that what is true about the video game industry is that you never really leave it. You know, I know that because yeah. you know I've been growing up with people in this business. I, you know, I asked you kind of um, you know what drew you to video games. What do you think about video games now? you know, in retrospect and thinking about all the relationships that it gave you and all the, you know, the, these incredible interactive entertainments that you, you helped to provide to the world. What do you think about video games now? Well, well, first of all, I'm, I'm very grateful for the whole video game industry and what it's brought me and my, my family and the relationships I have with so many people, whether they're former Sega people or our third party publishers, I'm very close with uh, many of the people at Electronic Arts today, for example, and, and at other companies. So that part is really important. Also, when I left Sega and I went to work in education technology, used video game technology or tried to curriculum more fun and interesting and compelling and personalized for for kids and teens and college age. And I'm still working on some of that stuff. Mm -hmm. You can see where I'm heading here. The video game industry creates wonderful, wonderful entertainment or what have you. Why can't we do a similar thing for education? And I really still believe we can. I think some of the stuff I did at LeapFrog, or I didn't do, but my team did, shows how much fun a uh, really good educational curriculum can become if you make it a game. There's a lot more to do, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. There's a lot more to do with video game technology and education. There's a lot more to do with video game technology in the health industry. And so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just pleased that I'm still a little bit of a part of it. That is fantastic. Well, I mean, we, we certainly wouldn't be where we are without the incredible work that, that, uh, that came through Sega, and this, especially during the Sega Genesis era. And Tom, it's, uh, it's been an honor to have you on the show today. I would love to have you back because I know that there's many, many stories and many, many things that we can discuss. So uh, may, I, may I call on you to come back on EP someday soon? Absolutely. I'd love to come back. This has been fun. I enjoy talking about it. It's great to have finally met you. Uh, it's great to meet you, too. Thank you, sir. All right, you yeah. guys. We, uh, Tom Kalinske. We have a, a review that uh, is kind of a bummer <laughs> after this fantastic conversation. Let's take a look at uh, Contra Rogue Corps. Way to go! You took him apart. Sometimes this job can feel like a lot of work. I played a game that gave me a headache. It was so 
disappointing and so not fun to play. I'm talking about the new Contra Rogue Core. I checked this out on the Nintendo Switch and the Xbox One just to see if there was any huge differences with the visual sort of fidelity and the quality. I first started to play this on the Nintendo Switch and I was completely shocked at how abysmal it looked on my big screen TV. It looks a little bit better obviously in portable mode, but this is a really, really bad looking game. It looks like a Nintendo 64 game. In fact, it looks so much like a Nintendo 64 game, I went and checked out a couple of cartridges on my Nintendo 64. One of them was BioFreaks from Midway, like 1996 era, and there's actually a cybernetic character that looks like one of the characters in Contra Rogue Core. <laughs> And another one I played was Robotron 64, which is a remake of the classic dual stick shooter Robotron. And that's what they've done here with Contra Rogue Core. It's a dual stick shooter. On the surface, I love that concept. I'm a huge fan of dual stick shooters, which were invented by one of my favorite game developers of all time, Eugene Jarvis. Robotron is one of my favorite games, period. And I just love that idea, that mechanic of being able to run in one direction and fire in another one. I thought, okay, well, it's a bit different for Contra, but it's a mode that seems to kind of work with the over-the-top insanity that a Contra game kind of promises. Now, there is a lot of over-the-top insanity in this game, but it's very clumsily built and you're gonna find yourself constantly struggling to kind of see all of the stuff that's shooting at you because you've also got other mechanics in there you can jump over obstructions you've got a leap to try to grab all of these vials of yellow goo which are counting down and will eventually explode so you're sort of looking in all nooks and crannies and trying to get there but you've got these massive bosses and really poorly constructed polygonal creatures that are going to block your sight and block where you're supposed to go and you're going to find yourself completely lost in whatever direction you're supposed to go and it becomes unendingly dissatisfying and frustrating. It's too bad because there I think there are some pretty decent concepts in here. I like the idea of this new cast of characters. One of them is kind of a retrofitted redux of some of the super soldiers that we've done, but he's got a giant drill in his hand and all kinds of robotic stuff all over him. Of course, you can augment the character and add all kinds of new weaponry on them. You've got a giant overgrown mutated panda with a massive Gatling gun type deal, and there's grenade launchers and things like that that you can throw on these different characters. <laughs> One of them is like an overgrown mutated bug type creature. And one of them actually is this super fast kind of lady samurai that's got a sword stuck into her sort of a, a festering creature inside of her stomach interesting character designs and I actually liked a lot of the cut sequence stuff. I actually talked with Emilio Lopez who's one of the artists that did the cut sequence work in here and I thought the storytelling and sort of the build up to this game was actually pretty damn interesting and then it's just completely squashed by the repetitive nature and the clumsy sort of level design and the ambiguous goals and challenges that you have to get. some you know somewhat interesting boss fights with giant robots and giant squishy mutated brains and things like that and you know it's always fun to blast at an army of different kind of mutated enemies and stuff and see them just blow up in little puffs of goo <laughs> And the mechanics are okay in places, but it's such a kludgy mess, you know? Even the 
idea of loading in between stages where it's like, okay, I made it to this door and then I'm going to, the door's going to blow it apart and then I'm going to load into another stage, which looks exactly the same as the stage that I just left. And then you'll beat a few levels and maybe the scenery will change from a, like a city kind of area to a park level. And then you're going to go back to a city level so that you're seeing a lot of repeated stuff over and over again. This game just does not feel contemporary, does not feel current. And even though there's Contra Pedigree sort of overseeing this title, it doesn't deliver on the Contra promise. One of the biggest challenges that this game faced is we just had the incredible Contra anniversary collection. We've just seen hardcore on the Genesis Mini. You know, and I even took a look back at Contra Rebirth on the Wii to see how that one holds up to 2019 standards, and it's actually really fun. And I also looked at Hardcore Uprising on Xbox One. It was a 360 game that's backwards compatible on my Xbox One. It was in my library. I said, sure, let's check this out. And it actually played really well. That one's made by Arc System. And then I had to go back to Contra Rogue Core and, you know, this inane menu system where you get a billion different things after you complete a level, but somehow you don't have the currency to be able to upgrade the way that you want to because you got to put all I mean it's just so convoluted and silly I do like that there's a sense of humor about having to go see crazy doctors that are going to do a lot of these transformations on you and there's a black market where you can eventually eke out enough cash so you can start to buy some stuff to kind of augment yourself but you have to tolerate the numbing gameplay and that's a real challenge They did throw in multiplayer in this game. You can play this couch co-op, which I think if you're going to play this, endure it with somebody else. That would be the preferred way to do it. I didn't have anybody with me, so I played it alone until I said, look, I'm having trouble with this boss. Let's get online and see if anybody's playing and play some co-op. Nobody's playing. Nobody was playing on the Switch. Nobody's playing on the Xbox One. I think the word is out, and, and this game is very disappointing. And I am extremely disappointed because uh, you know this has been a, a celebratory year for contra it's it's like contra is back in all of its glory and then we get this trash pile man this is just such a deflating experience and it just doesn't fit and i mean there's that indie game that blazing chrome game that i reviewed which is excellent as well There's just so many different developers that would have kicked ass with this concept. There's lots of indie titles that deliver action that's much superior to this, visuals that are much superior and more interesting than this. I just don't know what happened here, man. Konami just really didn't choose the right group of people to build this game. It's insufferable. <laughs> I'm whining, I'm complaining, I get it, I know, but that's how this game made me feel. It gave me a freaking headache. Contra Rogue Core is just a massive bummer, man. It's just not fun to play. 3.5 out of 10. Our buddy Warren is here. Good to see you, sir. Looking hello, hello. very sharp. I like the plaid he's representing. Oh, thank you. A little you. bit of plaid or thank you, thank checks. You. Looking good. Playing a little FIFA 20. This is the, uh, I turned the music off. 
and EA puts the music in the game still. Yeah, I, yeah it's of course it's in the game. Uh, but uh, this is the uh, the new Volta uh, uh, mode of uh, uh, FIFA 20, which is kind of the street mode. I'm gonna see if I can turn the music off actually, because right. I turned it off. But of, uh, of course it's back in there. And yeah, let's see. Let's make sure. Uh, game settings. They should just have the. You're gonna stream it, so turn off the music mode. Right. Right. Okay. Menu music. I guess it's just gonna have. Oh, there's three levels of audio. Okay. Gameplay music volume. Okay. I did turn off some of the music, but not all of it. Okay. There you go. Okay. All right. All right. So this is uh, street uh, street soccer. If anybody that's played uh, FIFA Street remembers that series as fondly as I do, it's not quite that. It's not super arcadey, uh, but it's uh, it's really well made, and it has. I think it's got all the the regular FIFA physics, so it's a little bit more um, taxing. Like you really have to kind of fight for the possession of the ball, but obviously it's a lot easier to score and uh, get the one timers. And there's some pretty cool celebrations that happen. Uh, and it, it looks damn good. Uh, I've only played a little bit of this, but I've been enjoying this quite a bit. Um, okay, you guys know this is Let's Play and Chat, and uh, this is where we uh, can talk a little bit about uh, that epic thing that just happened with Tom Kalinske on, uh, on EP Live. Wasn't he fantastic? Loved talking with Tom. So, Tom, if you're still watching, uh, thank you so much for being on the show. Um, and if you've got any questions or comments, or if you guys have questions or comments, uh, go ahead and ask them. Uh, okay, who wants to have an EP game session to Rogue Core? Let's all buy it. That's from a fat chimp. <laughs> you, if you guys want to burn your money like that, you guys go right ahead, right there. I never liked any of the FIFA games. I'm really not into sports games. This is from 76 <laughs> Demon 67. Yeah, I know. I, I still like sports games. It's not the obsession that I, I have... Uh, like, the, you know, there are sort of outlets and stuff out there that are just focused on sports titles, but I dig them. I dig the artistry. I dig the passion and the commitment to build something cool and the attention to detail. Um, and, you know, and oh. there's usually something really, really hooky in all, of, like FIFA especially and NHL and the NBA games that, that gets me to come back to them. Um, and I love checking in on, on these games. I don't have enough time to kind of play multiple seasons. As you guys know, I'm playing all the, the other stuff. But uh, this is the thing that excites me the most about this year's FIFA. Uh, fact from Wesley West. Uh, FS3 should be a buried treasure. F what's FS3? What's FS3? SF3? FS3. Don't know. you got to spell that out. Uh, question. Uh, what are your thoughts on the mobile Mario Kart? Uh, uh, having loot boxes, premium no, 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 no. currency, and a... $5 a month subscription from Dr. Game Love. I think it's absolutely atrocious. I think that game is an abomination. I think that <laughs> Nintendo should have looked at the market and has and completely veered in a different direction. Uh, it completely goes against everything that Satoru Iwata was talking about at GDC where he was saying it's going to be a race to the bottom and we got to be fair to consumers and we have to charge them a price and deliver them an experience. This is greed. That's what that game represents to me, and it doesn't correlate with what we know of Nintendo. You know, you know. Of course, Nintendo likes money, and of course, they've made lots of money. But I don't, I don't think of Nintendo as this big greedy corporation that's trying to cash in on people's obsessiveness. And when you look at a game like that, that's what it seems to be tailor-made for. And f quite frankly, the gameplay is not as good as uh, I've only played it for five minutes, but I didn't like it. It's not as good as um, playing something on any other Mario Kart platform. And there's many of many great versions of Mario Kart to play. Uh, it pisses me off if, if you want to be tr you know you want me to be truthful, especially when we have uh, Apple Arcade launching and we have the uh, the Google Play uh, variant Play Pass. Uh, there's two fine options for Nintendo to say, hey, you know what? Let's let's throw our marquee title into this equation and help bring up this uh, you know the idea of mobile gaming. Let's lift it up out of the uh, out of this uh, quicksand that is this microtransaction loot box kind of uh, um, reality that is pissing off so many game players out there. You know, mobile games when they when they first launched were awesome. They were incredible. You pay two bucks, three bucks, five bucks, ten bucks. You get the whole game, and you can play it on the planes. And then this free-to-play garbage uh, started to get in there, and uh, it's, it's really corrupted the whole experience. And uh, you know, so yeah, you asked me a simple question and you have a long-winded answer, but it, it, it's especially egregious that Mario Kart Tour launches the day, like days after Apple Arcade. Five bucks a month, 
for 100 games or five bucks a month to play a game that you probably have on tons of other systems in a better way. And they're going to try to hook you to unlock characters and eh. Okay. <laughs> Uh, question, why wouldn't EA move to an all-sports subscription game service? They will definitely do that. Uh, one price, free updates, never buy an annual game ever again. They are definitely going to do that. They have a, uh, a subscription thing in the works. Um, they are definitely going to try to do, uh, like, the Origin, but it's subscription and, and it's uh, all you can eat. I guess that's what Origin is, but I, they're also getting into streaming as well. So that's coming. That, that's coming to, to games. We're, we're going to be paying monthly fees and having access to massive libraries. It's going to be, you know, we're going to be able to download them and we're going to be able to play them on the cloud in a streaming sense. And certainly sports games are going to be a factor of that, especially if all of the, uh, uh, you know, all of the legislation starts taking effect with uh, loot boxes mm -hmm. and all of these different governments around the world say, no, what are you doing? You can't market these games to children and have gambling in them. Um, then we're going to see, well, we need to shift our whole financial models over to subscription-based content. Uh, it's All right. I had no idea EP is a live EP, uh, YouTube show that popped up in uh, my recommendation. I saw Tom Kalinske was on, so I had to tune in. Thank you so much, Jeremy Rutz. We have awesome guests on EP Live um, from video games, but also from movies and animation. And, and uh, uh, it's a lot of fun. We shoot uh, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday in the Vancouver uh, film School Cafe in Vancouver at 390 West Hastings, and you can come and join and be a part of the audience, and, uh, and you can watch the stream right here. Uh, GameCubes. I'm honestly surprised EA hasn't released their own console yet. I think the move is away from consoles. I think that's what we're doing here. Uh, Sticky uh, Chronic Bud says, great EP live today. Thank you so much. What do I think about the new trailer for The Last of Us 2 from Rick Savage? Oh my god. Looks incredible. Mm -hmm. So much in, you know, cinematic detail and, and just the flickers of uh, recognition and, uh, you know, the sort of the emotional weight just passing across a character but not even saying anything. Like, it's cinematic to the nth degree, you know? And it's uh, it really shows that Naughty Dog has been learning and learning and learning and, and tweaking and improving. It took my breath away. I can't wait for the game. Um, yeah, I'm excited as hell. Last of Us is one of the most special video game experiences I've ever had. It was one of the best I've ever had. And uh, it's a lot to live up to to make a game that's going to resonate in the same way. But I, I trust Naughty Dog. They're an incredible studio. Uh, so very excited. Greg Seward, how much uh, Kleenex will you need to keep on hand during uh, Last of Us 2? Yes. Yeah, it looks sad. It looks heavy. It looks like some really, really... I mean, it's all been heavy and dark in that, that game. Uh, this is for Victor. How come I don't see you at Fan Expo anymore? Uh, 76 Demon 67. I went last year. This year I was in Scotland for a wedding. I would have gone. I got, I got some great invites to uh, different things at Fan Expo this year. And had I not been um, uh, with my family having a great time, I would have been at Fan Expo this year. Uh, likely you will see me there next year. I've already been contacted about a couple things. Um, which I'll tell you guys about soon. Uh, uh, Luke Wolf, I wish 2K released another hockey video game. I thought they had the, the uh, simulation better than EA. I'll tell you something, the competition is a good thing. I'm going to take a look at uh, FIFA uh, against uh, PES 20. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, the strengths and weaknesses of both titles. But the competition in this space was and is a good thing. and, and uh, it's just, it's unfortunate that there are these, you know, licensing monopolies and, and uh, companies sort of saying, well, this is all ours, you know. We saw that when uh, EA bought up the Madden rights and Sony got the MLB rights. When these companies are kind of, you know, fighting for that market share and working to build something incredible, uh, it ends up being a win for us as gamers. All right. Uh, we've got two more questions and then we gotta, we got to wrap it. Vic, what do you think... Uh, will play who do you who do you think will play batman in the new batman game kevin conroy well actually no um roger craig smith in the warner brothers montreal game and he did an amazing job in origins i've been seeing some support for uh, arkham origins actually since we started talking about it the other day people coming out of the shadows saying that they love origins as well i love that game i thought it was great um and i think roger and uh, troy baker did great work as Batman and the Joker, so I would love to see those guys come back. 
Uh, Abby Jamison gets the last question. Uh, what, are, what are my thoughts on Respawn's Medal of Honor coming to Oculus? I talked a little bit about that in the, uh, in the rundown. Um, I'm excited to play it. Respawn is phenomenal. I would have preferred that to be a Titanfall announcement, but uh, uh, I'm super excited that uh, EA is getting um, like a full-priced, full big game, like a AAA type of experience on, on, uh, in VR. Uh, I, I'm psyched about that. So, uh, and I love Respawn. They're amazing. Uh, okay, last comment from uh, Bo Bono Edgy. Bono, Bono Edgy. Hey, Vic, much love from uh, Saskatoon. Thanks for having Tom on the show. Been a long-time fan of your content. Keep up the awesome sauce, my friend. That is very sweet. Uh, you guys have all been super, super wonderful today. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Uh, big special thanks to Tom Kalinske for, uh, for coming on EP today. And thank you all for joining us. We'll be back on uh, Monday with a new show for you. We are joining the climate strike here in Vancouver, as is the Vancouver Film School. Um, so we won't be uh, having a new show on Friday uh, in support of, uh, you know, uh, more climate awareness. Um, uh, which I think is a good thing. So if you can do that, I think you guys should do that as well. Uh, but uh, we will definitely be posting some new content uh, over the next little while, and we will see you all with a brand new EP Live on Monday. Until then, have yourselves a great time and play forever.